I'd like to introduce our next speaker. He's also going to be talking about uh, a scalability issue with uh, Git and how we've we've uh, started to address that at, at GitHub and, and and so forth. So I'll let uh, Rick do it. The other notable thing about Rick uh, is that he learned Vim in the Air Force. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna welcome Rick Olson from GitHub. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, hi. Um, so I apologize for the vague talk title. Um, until yesterday, I couldn't actually mention what I was going to talk about. So this is a blog post that we shipped uh, last night in Paris about uh, in Paris time about Git large file storage. It's a, it's an open source Git extension that I've been working on. So I want to. Uh, talk about building it and why, it's, uh, why it works the way it does. Um, so I'm Rick Olson, and uh, I go by TechnoWeenie um, on the net. And uh, I work at GitHub. I'm a back-end Ruby and Go developer. Uh, my, my team, we work primarily on uh, the features of GitHub that, use, uh, that work with binary files, but not in Git. So like avatars and uh, you know the release binary uploads, and uh, now uh, get LFS. So, so what problem am I trying to solve? What scaling issue? Um, so basically, so for a lot of teams that are using Git successfully right now, they're they're doing it uh, you know correctly, right? They're they're working with um, you know after they've gone through the uh, learning process, they've they're working with uh, text uh, source code files, documentation. Uh, you know, if they're working on websites or you know they're working with uh, small images, and uh, yeah, Git works great for that. Uh, that's exactly what it is designed to do. Um, problems come up when people start working with bigger files. Like I'm not talking about uh, big repositories like uh, like Will um, with the Twitter repository. I'm talking about storing files, like individual files that are really big, beyond 10 or 50 or 100 megabytes. Um, and initially, the, the, the real trouble here is that you don't even notice it's a pain point at first. You're just like committing these files happily, and then slowly like you start noticing issues. Like It takes longer and longer to do a fresh clone. Um, so the first thing that we did is we set up server-side limits that analyze the, uh, you know, your git push on the server. And if you have any files over 50 megabytes, we print a little warning in your, uh, you know, in your terminal. And if it's over 100 megabytes, we just reject the push. Um, and this was nice because then people weren't pushing giant files in, onto our servers, and they weren't um, causing problems like uh, cut, you know, making our servers like generate like giant pack files on clones and things like that. Um, it's also giving feedback to the teams, like, hey, you know, you're using Git incorrectly. You're you're about to have a bad time, so maybe you should look at your development process. Um, but I, I never really liked that solution because you know you get these teams and you know they've gone, oh, yeah, they've crossed the first hurdle, like kind of learning how Git works, and they start using it, and they run into this issue immediately, and then they get to learn about git filter branch and have rewriting their repository history. And that's, that's no fun, and I, I think it gives a bad initial perception of, uh, of git. So I, I, just, I really wanted to uh, provide a better experience for these users. Uh, so uh, a lot of projects, uh, projects that I've been involved in, open source projects, um, they're, you know, about they're all about scratching my own itch. These are problems that like I'm experiencing myself, so then I know like um, I, ca I can better make decisions de uh, decisions on uh, how to solve those problems. But this this was not like that. Um, this isn't a problem that I was having, or really like anyone at GitHub was having. It was really like our users coming to us about it and talking to other. People that work on Git servers and things like that, like uh, like Atlassian, and they're having the same, you know, they're getting the same feedback. Um, so I reached out to uh, Chrissy. She's uh, she's on our user experience team, and uh, I remember like when she joined the company at first, I was like, why do we need a user experience 
research person. You know, um, she she spoke to the company about turning everyone that worked on product into user researchers, and I'm like, ah, oh, that's that's BS. So um, I made a made it a point to reach out to her and um, see if she could help me out with this project. To, like um, talk to uh, talk to our users and get insight into their workflow and see what we can do to uh, help them out. Um, we started out looking at uh, metrics, you know, uh, uh, server-side metrics and like the number of support requests. And then we started reaching out to people, people that email us or tweet at us, or maybe they just post in some Git forum. Um, so we, we try to build up like a diverse set of teams to interview and just talk to them and heard their gripes. Um, one of my favorite stories was from a team in South Africa, and they were having an issue that, uh, that I called uh, push sniping. And the problem that they're having is that they'll have an artist or someone that's working on uh, some big file, like a Photoshop file or whatever, and they go to push it. And pushing from South Africa to github.com in America is really slow, and especially if you're pushing a giant file. And, and uh, push sniping, is when, when uh, while they're making their push, someone else will change like a, a readme or you know like a normal like do a normal git push, and their push will complete while the other one is still uploading. And then when that one finishes, it looks at the master ref or whatever they're updating, and it returns you know it says oh well the ref has changed you got to start over no, you got to pull and start over. Um, so that, yeah, that was a really uh, unique problem. Um, really liked talking to those guys. Uh, um, so at the end of this, Chrissy and I, we prepared a final report with uh, recommendations and aspirations. And this, was, um, this helped inform uh, my team, like some of the things to do you know, that we wanted to experiment with. It also informed uh, the rest of the company you know, to help um, you know, prove that this is something worth taking on. Uh, so what are first principles? Um, this is actually uh, like a, a physics term. Uh, it's something we talk about internally in the company, but I couldn't find any reference of us talking about it publicly. So um, I did find this article. It was an interview with Elon Musk, uh, you know, the CEO of uh, Tesla and uh, SpaceX. And he talks about first principles, and he was talking about um, how they design their batteries, and basically just ignoring the the uh, the uh, current understanding on building batteries, and they broke the problem down to its most you know to very basic elements, and re-examine it with a clear focus, and then they're able to you know build really good batteries and all that stuff. So. Um, so in our user research, there are two themes that, that came up, things, things that were very important to me and uh, things that I thought needed, um, needed to be a focus for this. So, so the first one is usability. Um, there are actually a couple tools that exist now, uh, Git Media uh, and Git Annex and a few others. Um, and they're built for Git experts. They require a lot of upfront configuration in the repository. Um, they sometimes introduce new commands. Uh, they don't quite always work with the existing workflows. They don't work with any of the uh, hosted services. And I really wanted to solve that problem. I really wanted to make it easy for people using Git to, to uh, get up and going as fast as possible, get their work done. Um, so as a, as a Ruby guy, um, so convention over configuration, this is a common theme for, uh, for Ruby on Rails. And uh, I really like that. I wanted to apply that to uh, get large file storage. Um, the second thing, GitHub uh, hosts code. So um, I, I, I was really interested in finding a way to, uh, for this get large file extension, get large file storage extension to, uh, to work with with the you know, with github.com and I wanted to do it in a way that didn't have any vendor lock-in um, no proprietary solutions I want it to be uh, an open API you know just like just like git right because all it is is your client is 
speaking over some defined API to another server. And you could be talking to GitHub, you could be talking to uh, Bitbucket or any of the other Git servers. And they, internally, like behind the scenes, they're dealing with the Git repositories very differently, but they're all supporting that same API. And I really, I really like that. Um, so how does, um, awesome, the animation works. So this is a, <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a diagram of how large file storage works, kind of at the high level. So you've got your local repository and your remote at the top, and your code files, they just go directly into the Git repository. But larger files, say like a Photoshop file, um, a pointer, that's what we're calling it, um, it goes into the Git repository, and it's really just um, just like, like a link, like it's not the actual file, it's a substitute. And then the actual file goes up to a um, large file storage server. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay, and the really cool thing about this though is um, it works without adding a lot of extra stuff to your, your Git flow. Um, you get workflow. So this is what the uh, setup looks like. Uh, so when you first install the tool, you need to run uh, git lfs init, and this sets up some um, some git you know global git configuration values. Um, and then you need to tell the git attributes file uh, what file types you want to put uh, you want to store in the git large file storage server. Um, and uh, th you know, so this shows the track command, which does that for you, or you can just open up the .git attributes file and edit it yourself. And this is what a clone is like. And you know, it's simp you know, the same clone command you're used to, but then at the bottom you see downloading some file.zip. So that's that's where that um, git lfs is doing its thing. And then this is the uh, you know really simple pull request workflow, and there are no like new commands or anything like that. You can just create your your branch, add your file, commit, and push. And then you can see at the top the uploading message. So every you know your standard Git workflow will keep working. Um, so how does it do that? Oh, well, uh, Git attributes and specifically the smudge and clean filters. Um, these are uh, kind of awkward to talk about. People get them confused. So I like to think of the Git repository as a clean room. And everything is, is sterile. Uh, when you're running the git add command, you, you have this dirty file in the working directory. And as you add it, it gets cleaned up into the Git repository. Um, and and what it's, what it's doing is it's converting it to that uh, that text pointer. Um, and then when you check out, it does the reverse of it. You've got that clean text pointer, and it's going through the smudge process as it writes it to your to your uh, working directory. And then it spits out your like actual large file. Um, so this is what the text pointer looks like. Uh, it's similar to the uh, Git Media one, but we added some more metadata to it. So one is the version string. Uh, this this gives us flexibility to uh, to increment the uh, text pointer format in the future. And also, if you happen to clone a repo and you've never heard of Git LFS or anything, and you just see these like tiny PSD files, and you open them up and they don't open in Photoshop, you can at least look at them and like, oh, well, there's a URL here, but let me put that in my browser and and uh, see what it's about. Um, so another really important part is uh, native app support. So this is a screenshot from the uh, GitHub desktop client for, for the Mac. And I don't know if you can see that, but that's a progress bar. And at the bottom, it's downloading a large asset. Um, so you know it's integrated just fine in the uh, GitHub for Mac and Windows clients. And I think they're all released uh, like last night too. Yes. yes? All right. Um, 
The cool thing, though, the interesting thing is uh, the GitHub for Mac client was written before libgit2, so it still shells out to Git in a few spots. And they're, they're actually the first ones to implement Git LFS support. Uh, the Windows client was a little more difficult because from day one it was using libgit2, and it turns out the clean and smudge filter support in libgit2 was not great. Uh, this is a pull request from Amy on the desktop team, and this is she is adding support for uh, the the improved uh, clean smudge filter implementation in libgit2 sharp. Uh, I, th I think the the problem was libgit2 would buffer the contents in memory and then pass it to some function in C, and the new the updated version uh, streams it, so you know we don't eat up all the memory. Um, but the really exciting part for me is the API. Um, this is really just a JSON API front end for your Git server. So, um, so we have an implementation for github.com, of course, uh, but it, it's designed in a way that any Git server, uh, you know, other cloud hosts or um, on-premise um, installs like uh, GitHub Enterprise, or even the really small ones like uh, GitOlite or whatever, they, they could, in theory, implement this. Um, and since this, is, this should be run next to your Git server, so it can take advantage of, your, you know, of that server's built-in authentication and authorization uh, code. So when you access Git LFS, uh, that through the API or uh, when the uh, you know when the client does it knows who you are it uses the same access controls that uh, that github.com does and then the the client itself doesn't need to support all these different backends it just supports this one API and then anyone can implement this API and they can use git LFS um, and one of the cool things about Host, you know, about running this server next to your Git server is now um, your Git host can understand Git, you know, these large objects. They're not just text blobs. This is a Photoshop file that is, um, that is being viewed through our uh, render feature. And uh, yeah, and that file is stored in Git LFS. Um, you can't, I don't, I don't think you can see, but up there in the corner, like that is the actual file size and not the file size of the text pointer, which would be like not even 200 bytes. So on github.com, uh, the, the file looks just like a re real file. It's not a text pointer. Um, and uh, yeah, so here's what the API looks like. Um, I don't know if, if you're not a JSON API person, then this is probably kind of Greek to you. But it's uh, just uh, th so this is a, an API call to download a file, um, and the server returns some JSON properties. You get you know, the the object ID, which is a SHA-256 uh, signature of the the object contents, and then the the file size. And then there's that links property, and that includes some uh, hypermedia links. And that basically just means it's the Git LFS API is telling the client like where, you know, how it can download the file. So in this example, it's saying you can get it from gitlfsserver.com, like this URL. And then if you, um, and then it, you can also specify the uh, um, HTTP headers to set. So here we're saying, you know, set your authorization header to this token to so that you have access to download this file, and then the client will follow that link and download the file. Um, and upload request is similar, um, but you're 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 sending the OID and the size to the Git LFS server. So you know this request is saying, like, hey, I'll. Um, I want to upload this file. T tell me where to put it. Uh, so in that JSON output has more hypermedia links. Uh, there's an upload link, and that's you know saying yeah, you can put that file on this you know git lfs server.com URL, and you know again it can pass in the whatever headers it needs, um, and then there's also an optional verify hook. So if if the location of the uh, of the files is separate 
um, you may the, the client may need to talk back to the Git LFS API to say, hey, I upload the file. You can you know make it available. Uh, so so as a real world example on GitHub.com when uh, when you use this, we're going to return S3 links with uh, the headers necessary to sign the request, and then uh, that will give you you know just that temporary access to that to that key you know to either upload or download it. Um, but you know we don't have access to uh, S3 really. Um, I mean it is our S3 account and we can set up some stuff on the back end. But I wanted to build it into this API in case people want to put this in front of other storage services. So once the client is uploaded to S3, then it talks back to the to the uh, LF, get LFS API and says, "Hey, I'm done." You know, verify it, and then once uh, GitHub has verified it, then it can mark the object as ready for other clients to download it. Um, so authentication, this was a big part of it. Um, so when you're, so it, so it integrates. It's making API calls from your, you know, from the uh, Git LFS client, and those API calls will, you know, require some form of authentication. But we did not want people to set up a you know dual passwords we want the server to uh, you know since it's hosted alongside your 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 git server then it should be able to you know depending on the implementation it should be able to take the same passwords or tokens or whatever so if you're using uh, https remotes it just it um, there's a an in, in, uh, internal git Credential command, and it can say, "Hey, I, I, I'm, I want to talk to GitHub.com. Do you have a stored password?" And then Git credentials will uh, will uh, just send it back because if you're using HTTPS remotes, you've probably already entered in your password before. Uh, yeah. So, um, but. Uh, so the way it knows where the LFS server is is it takes your remote URL and by default, if there's no other configuration, it adds a suffix to it. So here, you at the you know for the default, it adds this info LFS um, extension. So um, so on our servers, you know we have HA proxy set up with all these links and uh, you know it's looking for the different URLs and if it's like github.com you know just like the home page it's going to the rails app but if it's um, if it's a, a git URL then it sends it back to our our um, git service and now if it has this info LFS suffix then it sends it to our LFS server uh, but we don't want you to you know, we don't want you to uh, force this on people because you may be using a Git host uh, that doesn't support the Git LFS API. Because today, like, there are no um, services besides our uh, our reference implementation. So this isn't even quite available yet on GitHub.com. So you can set you can set uh, LFS URL in, in the Git config, and it will use that instead. And this could be a server. Um, like on Heroku or whatever, doing you know whatever, whatever backend you want to do. Um, you can also set a custom LFS URL per remote. So maybe your origin is from GitHub, and then your you have another branch going to a separate Git server, say Bitbucket, but maybe they don't have LFS support yet, or maybe you. Um, you use say uh, use GitHub, but you don't want to put your files uh, like on our service. You know, you just want to use uh, S3 or whatever. You can do that too. Um, also, not not everybody uses HTTPS remotes. A lot of people use SSH. So we um, so part of Git LFS is a new uh, SSH command that that it runs, and basically. Um, it returns back the uh, the header necessary to authenticate with the API, um, so uh, so you don't have to mess with uh, Git, Git credential setup. Um, yeah, so the so the initial announcement and release is just uh, version 0 0.5 of the client library, and we don't have uh, full support. On GitHub.com, yet there's there's a waiting list, and you can go to uh, 
man, I should have had the URL somewhere, um, get-lfs.github.com, um, or go to the blog and you can read about it. Um, and when we open up the wait list, then you can start using GitHub. But the project is still new, so I want to go over some of the, uh, the, the bigger ideas with this. Um, I feel like, oh, geez. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I, I want is uh, uh, narrow downloads. And the idea that when you check out a repository with lots of files, you don't necessarily need to download everything. Um, maybe you don't, you're, uh, you're, maybe you're a music composer and you just want the audio files or whatever in a specific directory. So that's one of those ideas that we're kicking around. Uh, another one, this is not a popular idea in Git because, um, <laughs> you know, branches should make this obsolete, right? But this is something very important to the, this, you know, this, uh, these, these users because, uh, you know, these are people that are like maybe two people start touching the same Photoshop file and that is not a format that you can really merge. So it'd be nice if the second person could, you know, either, you know, it'd be nice if they could, you know, be notified, like, hey, someone else is in that file, maybe you should talk to them or wait or, or do it in another branch and then you're not, um, yeah, then you're not competing with them. Um, and another thing too, uh, the actual Git LFS client right now is written in Go and, um, you know, I, I love Go, but I, for this project, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we can, put out a statically compiled binary that users can download. They don't need to install Go. They don't need to install Ruby or Python and, you know, with the right version and all the dependencies and stuff. I mean, like as a Ruby developer, it's not that difficult, but it's not something I would wish on someone that isn't a Ruby developer. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my talk. Um, we would love, you know, we'd love feedback. I would love for other hosting services to look at this and maybe we can come up with some solution that we can, we can all use and agree on. Um, so this is the, the current uh, core team. So it's myself and uh, Rubyist. Um, yeah, and that's it. Let's go drink. <laughs> uh. I guess, I guess I have three minutes for yep. questions, or you can just grab me later. Um, There's a question down here. Okay, so he's asking what happens if you have an existing repo with large files? Uh, so then you have to go through the one-time painful process of rewriting your history and pulling those objects out and uh, kind of retroactively adding LFS support, or you could just say, screw it, like we've been using this repository and we're just going to start, you know, starting today we'll use git LFS. Like that's not something I would ever do on the uh, GitHub repo because we have, you know, vendor gem files. Um, cool. Anyone else? I would just want to say, I'd suggest you might retry the BFG, but uh, we can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> He's suggesting uh, we use uh, BFG, so yeah, I'll look into that. Um, all right, cool. There's another question up here. Oh, we have time for one more. I'm sorry? What about garbage collection? <laughs> oh, garbage collection, yeah. Um, so you're talking on the, the local machine where the... Uh, on the server. Yeah, I mean, it's up to the server to implement it. So they would have to know that, you know, if, if a branch gets deleted, they, they would have to go through and delete the objects. Um, yeah, so Dave is asking about uh, garbage collection on the client and prefetching. Um, I haven't even thought about prefetching right now. Um, I would love to talk more about that. And I think John, who's going up after me, he's got some ideas on garbage collection on the client. So um, yeah, here he has to say in a, in a bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Rick. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat>
Thank you.